This tape is part of the Middle Tennessee Oral History Collection designated as MT2000.118. This is Betty Rowland. Today is Tuesday, May 21st, 2002, and I'm interviewing Margaret Salm at her home located in Hillsboro. Uh, well, in Nashville, I yeah. guess. The tape of this interview, along with the transcription of the interview, will become part of the MTSU Oral History Collection and will be available to the public. Future researchers may include portions of, of this interview in their publications. Is that all right with you, Margaret? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I need for you to state your full name. Mary Margaret. Uh, maiden name was Schussler, and last name is Psalm. Okay. And your date of birth? January the 5th, 1921. And your place of birth? Chattanooga. Okay. I was adopted. I was <laughs> adopted at four months, and so I was sent to Nashville to the Tennessee Children's Home. And so this is, I consider Nashville my home, really. Uh -huh. Okay. Your father's name and his occupation? His name was John Q. Schussler. He was an executive of the Methodist Church and he was a minister, mm -hmm. but didn't have a church, thank goodness. And my mother was a homemaker and she was ill most of my life. And what was her name? Uh, Mary Irene. Now, these are your adoptive parents? Mm -hmm. And how old were you when they adopted you? Four months. My goodness. Mm -hmm. That's you can precious. see my little picture there. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's great. Uh, we were talking before we turned on the tape about your early memories yeah. here in Mur in uh, Nashville. Share with me some of those memories. Well, for, I could, before the war, I was writing to a lot of the boys in the service, and uh, <laughs> Jack Slatton was one of those. Uh -huh. uh, but... Uh, now, were you in high school at that time? No, I wasn't. I was out of high school. Or, yeah, out yeah. of high school. Uh -huh. And, uh... Why were you writing? Pen pals. How did you get the information? Well, <laughs> I don't remember now how I got it all. Mm -hmm. My husband was a pen pal. Uh -huh. and he was stationed in Bermuda. Uh -huh. uh, that came about because the women's clubs of Nashville got together and made up packages to send to soldiers overseas. Mm -hmm. And some packages went to... Bermuda, mm -hmm. and some of the boys wrote back in the interview in the newspaper that it, they would like to write to girls, and so Margaret <laughs> wrote to John. So it it was a way that people were expressing patriotism. Oh, I guess so. Yes, mm -hmm. to keep morale up. Right. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. I haven't heard that story. I've heard people talk about uh, organizing dances yeah. for servicemen. Yeah. Do you remember any no, of that? No, I don't remember any of that. Mm -hmm. What are some of your earliest memories of the war? Well, as I said, pen pals. And then when uh, World War II came along, uh, Pearl Harbor, then of course that uh, started escalating everything about service people. Well, but you were already writing to servicemen before mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor? Mm -hmm. That's great. Tell me, uh, on the home front here, what things were like. I know there was rationing. What What do you remember? I don't remember much about that. I remember going down to the school on uh, Belmont Boulevard to sign up for ration books mm -hmm. and uh, doing that. Uh, but uh, as far as rationing, it, it didn't seem to bother me. Well, I wasn't home long enough. I joined in 43, so I didn't have too much experience with uh, mm -hmm. rationing. Where did you go to school? I went to Peabody Dem School, okay. which is University School of Nashville now. Mm -hmm. Were young men being called to the service at that time? I graduated in 38, so mm -hmm. that war hadn't even started in Europe then. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you remember of the day and the news of the Pearl Harbor attack. I know it was Sunday. <laughs> I know we were having lunch and radio was on. and. It, it's kind of like the experience of the World Trade Center, except you didn't have the visual going on. You just heard the news that was being broadcasted, and knowing that uh, that would mean some changes coming on. Did you understand just how powerful that news was and how it would affect your life? No, I don't think I thought about it. 
we were talking, the questions that I usually, the yeah. guidelines that I usually uh, use, really don't apply yeah. to your story. So I'm going to sit back and let you tell <laughs> me Margaret's story of World War II. Well, my story, not very exciting, but um, it was an adventure. Uh, I, want, I was learning uh, radio engineering by the Signal Corps first. Uh, well, now, before you go there, tell me how you de you decided to join. Join. What brought about that decision? How did you choose the branch of service? I mean, you didn't just do this on the spur of the moment. I mean, no. Uh, uh, I, as I said, I was learning radio, well, radio engineering, but it got too hard, and I said, "Oh, well, I'm I'm going to join the WAC." Oh, you were learning radio engineering before mm -hmm. you joined the service. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm in forty-two. Mm -hmm. Where were you doing that? That was Case Reserve. Well, it's Case Supply at School of Science then. Now it's Case Reserve, Western Reserve up in Cleveland, Ohio. But we would have gone to Wright Patterson Field in Ohio. Uh -huh. But I had my father go down to the recruiting office and get me brochures on the WAC, and I read that, and I came home and I joined. Why did you choose? Because the WACs were only ones that went overseas. We were the first. Uh, the WACs came along in July of 40, 42. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't interested in them. They didn't go overseas. And that's the chance to go was mm -hmm. the WAC. But, uh, and my father, it was proud of me if I'd been a boy going off. How'd your mom feel? I don't remember. She was sick, and she had Parkinson's disease, and uh, uh, I don't think she really understood too much, really, what it was about. Mm -hmm. But your father gave his blessing. Oh, yes. And uh, I joined up on, sworn in on February the 11th, 1943. Mm -hmm. and Here in Nashville? Yes, uh -huh, at the Custom House. We had our physicals out at the, uh, well, we all call it the classification center. It has a different name. I believe Army Air Force uh, classification, probably. But we call it classification center, where they classified the boys for be pilot or navigator or bombardier. Mm -hmm. We had our physicals out there dressed in sheets, and the boys said, take it off, take it off. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised that the physicals were done at the same place. Yeah. That's a, a little surprising. Yeah. Now, what does WAC stand for? We, well, originally it was the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, mm -hmm. and that was a big mistake. They found that out pretty quick uh, because they didn't have that much control over us as they would if we were entirely in the Army. And so, uh, but first uh, it was WAAC, mm -hmm. and July of 43 became WAC when they got rid of the auxiliary part. We had to be sworn in again. To, to girls had an opportunity to get out then if they didn't want to stay, and so some did. Not many uh, left, but uh, James, I reported to uh, Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, for basic training on in March of '43, and the girls that were coming from the north thought they were coming down to orange blossoms and sunshine. And all. It was cold. Anything at night froze in the barracks. Mm -hmm. And we had pot-bellied stoves. And, and of course, those buildings were not uh, insulated at all. They were just thrown up. And it was cold at night. But we had everything that the guys would have except for uh, training with arm, arms or firearms. We had courtesy, military courtesy, article to war. Uh, first aid, we had a lot of marching. Uh, we had uh, pool KP, of course, <laughs> and that was a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> but we were in the, I was fortunate, I, at least I thought so. Oglethorpe was an old cavalry post way before World War I. And uh, of course it had nice big parade ground and uh, the buildings around it. Uh, one side was the officers, quarters and over on one other side was the enlisted personnel and those buildings one building held 300 people in it uh, there were two sides <coughs> each side 150 people yes. and uh, <laughs> took a little getting used to that of course being have been for men uh, no privacy you know 
they had this big open area in the basement for the latrine, the showers, and all. But they had to put up stalls for us, you know, for privacy. Uh, otherwise, it was just wide open. Now, I've talked to men who went through Fort Oak. Yeah. Were there men there at the same time you were there? Um, before we got there, yes. Um, Colonel Hobby was in charge of the WAG. She and uh, Colonel who? Hobby. Oh, okay. Uh, she she was one smart lady, bless her heart. Uh, she uh, and an officer from the War Department came down there. Uh, I believe it was uh, in 42, um, and looked over the place and informed the commandant that it was going to be taken over to be a training center for the WAC. And his reply was, "I'll be goddamn <laughs> old army man, you know." And so it changed. Well, he was a nice guy. He, uh, I found out later somebody who's now dead, who used to be stationed there, an officer, was in charge of uh, things. The German compound there, there were POWs there, and he told me that uh, they got better meat than we did. <laughs> I thought that was nice, wasn't it? German POWs getting better meat than the, our army. Now, the, the women's services in uh, World War II, which branch formed first? The oh, wax, wax, wax was first. Wax was they first. They were May fifteenth. Oh, we had a birthday, didn't we? Uh, May fifteenth, nineteen forty-two. Okay, and then the waves came along July okay. forty-two, and the others were later. Okay, Marines were I think came up in forty-three. Okay, I'm not sure. So we we were talking before we started the tape about breaking ground, uh, and that women often have to do that. Um, so this is a relatively new program. Yes. Uh, well, was it, how far along was it when you joined? Well, poor gals in Des Moines, that was the first WAC training center. In the wintertime, they had to wear men's overcoats, but they didn't have uniforms for the women. Mm -hmm. They And they fussed around about how they were going to do it and what they were going to, and what color it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And uh, they... Uh, they didn't measure for women. They measured the things by men's measurements, and so things didn't fit very well, you know. Mm -hmm. But poor gals in the wintertime up there were marching in the mud with over men's overcoats down to the ground, you know. So they weren't prepared for us. They they really weren't. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think opened the doors to have? They just needed. So they many needed other, people. Yeah. They needed. They uh, needed the men. They de in needed combat. to release. They, yeah, they needed to release the men for combat. Mm -hmm. Not that everyone went, but I mean, uh, they needed them. What did your friends think about your decision to join? Girlfriends. Well, I had some that did join. Really? Some of my classmates joined. Mm-hmm. Okay. But they joined the waves because they thought the waves were a little higher class than the wax. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, tell me about your uniform. Oh, my. <laughs> it, um, it wasn't the most beautiful thing in the world uh, since you had army men saying how things went. You, you, and poor Harvey, she was doing her best to get us the best say she could. Mm -hmm. And I, we all hated that hobby hat that we had. I've seen a picture of it. Yeah. And uh, it, <laughs> I hated that thing. Uh, Fortunately, eventually they gave they gave it up, and you could have overseas cap, you know, and wear that. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, sometimes the colors didn't match. Uh, I had one kind of a uh, green skirt and a chocolate co uh, jacket. Whatever was within the warehouse, they said we're going to use it. <laughs> so, but uh, did you have pants? Not till 1944. Late '44, overseas. They did didn't have them here first. Uh, we had them first over there, in the, in the Europe. Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna let you get back to telling your basic training story. Well, uh, we all uh, used to go on hikes uh, with packs on our backs, and we used to uh, go. What kind of weight would that pack have? It wasn't too bad. It was what we call a musette bag, and. It was, Fed it over his chaps over his shoulders. Uh, if if you would, they didn't have us put a lot of stuff in it. Just kind of normal 
but uh, we used to go on hikes and do that. How long? Not very long. Maybe uh, eight miles. That's pretty long. Overseas training, we had to learn how to fall in the dirt <laughs> and other things. Mm -hmm. but, uh, what other things did you do in at, um, basic training? In basic training. Um, well, it was mostly learning all about the Army and, and what it's made up and how to salute and how to march and uh, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Oglethorpe was nice. I pulled a trick. I knew that I'd be shipped out. I didn't know where I would go to my first station. So I had my, told my father, you get the doctor. The doctor was a good friend of the family. I said, you have him contact the uh, Red Cross and get me home uh, to see my mother. And uh, of course she's ill. And so I did that, he did that. And I got called in and you know, you got to pass now to go home. And for a, I don't know how many days, but anyway, rode the train from Chattanooga to Nashville, standing up because they were packed in those days. And the boys on the train kept coming back to look at me because they hadn't seen a black before. And when I got off the so train, you, you were traveling in uniform. Yeah. And when I got off the train, one of them took my luggage off for me. But uh, you might be in a uniform, but you were still a lady, right? That's what they thought we were in those days, what they made us to be. It's not like today. <laughs> what did you do uh, in basic training? Did you have uh, free time or times yeah. of entertainment? We had free time after, after what? After retreat, after 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Until not lights out at 9. And what were you able to do? Oh, you could go over to the uh, enlisted men's club or you could go... Uh, you didn't want to do much of anything. You're kind of tired after all those things. You get shots on Friday and you, and you have to scrub the barracks for inspection the next morning. So, you know, it... Uh, well, now, how did, uh, how did waves, uh, how was that taken in the enlisted men's club? Uh, that would be another first, I'm sure. Yeah, I guess so, but... Ah, you know, it's a different world then. Uh, people don't know what it was like. It, uh, the boys back then treated you like, like a sister, a lot of them, I know, and they didn't uh, mess around. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, we were received pretty well. I know some places when girls went out on their first station, some of the guys were kind of upset because they thought they would be having to go overseas. Didn't like that. When you came home in your uniform, what? How were you? How, how did people feel about seeing you in uniform? People that you had known? No, I, nobody said anything that I know about that I remember. Mm -hmm. So it was accepted. Yeah. Did you feel that they were treating you with the respect that you would expect being in the? being in the army? I or were you treat just a girl in the army? <laughs> I don't think I was treated any differently than I had been before. Mm -hmm. okay. What happens after basic? Basic, we waited around. You have to wait to be uh, for your, where you're going to be sent. And a lot of them said, oh, I don't want to go to Cooks and Baker School. That was the worst thing you, you did get, you know. Oh. And uh, no one wanted that. But uh, some of us got shipped to California, and we were about the first wax on the West Coast. We went by troop train and had slept two in a lower berth uh, and had, of course, had meals on the train mm -hmm. and uh, got to California, and we were picked up at the station by trucks and took out to, out to the field at Stockton. And the boys were all set for us. They had the mess hall all decorated, they have flowers around, and the phone in the day room kept ringing off the wall because they were wanting dates. They hadn't seen wax before, mm -hmm. and so they were curious. And now what base were you? Stockton Field, California. Stockton Field, California. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was kind of fun. But, uh, things kettles settled down after a while. Mm -hmm. Now, you were talking about not wanting to be sent to Cooks and Baker yeah. School. Um, 
What other assignments? You could have gone mortar school, school you could have gone radio, you could have gone, um, what else? Uh, administrative school, um, something like that. Mm -hmm. Did you have something that you were wishing for? Uh, I, since I've been w learning radio, that's what I wanted because what you want, you don't tell them because that you won't get it. Oh, really? It's always something else. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the army for you. And uh, so, uh, because I had worked part time in a library, they put me in the uh, intelligence library which really was not a library, but um, they had confidential uh, material in there. I had been cleared by the FBI to work in there. Now, is this at Stockton? Stockton, uh -huh. mm -hmm. And uh, there were three of us working, and Ed, one was Lieutenant, was, uh, Lieutenant Zingle. Uh, he was in charge of uh, teaching the cadets. This was an aviation school for the cadets. And he taught them identification and he was in charge of the library, and there was a corporal and myself working in there. We all three had German names. Mm -hmm. And when I was being interviewed in the intelligence office, I said, oh, I have relatives in foreign countries, you know. <laughs> and where? <laughs> but I said, I don't know. I do have relatives in Brazil, but that didn't count. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was investigated. They came next door to our next door neighbors checking on me. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, let me work in there. Uh, we had a teletype machine that got the news every day, and we had big maps on the wall. Um, I can show you one. Okay. Is that you? Uh huh. Oh, I. I'm gonna send some back, someone back with a digital camera to make a picture of that to use on our website. Oh. This is, this is a great picture. That is a huge map. It's well, they had all the theaters of war. Uh -huh. uh, we had the European, we had the uh, Pacific over there, and uh, others. Um, and each day we had to change, you can see the planes, change the battle lines and w w had been bombed. And oh, uh, now this is that's the teletype. Mm -hmm. That is a really long printout. What uh -huh. kind of information are you getting from about that? battles and, and what was bombed and where they were and what was going on? Is this just a staged picture or? Yeah, it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wondered if there were people there that you had to brief on what had happened. No, not really. It was only for the officers and for the cadets. And uh, she was just there for the picture. Okay. One of the things that I noticed in the picture, I'm going to stop the story for just a second. You're wearing a ring. Were there no restrictions on jewelry? Mm -mm. Well, there had to be. You could wear a watch, a bracelet, and you could wear. Uh, like stud earrings, you know, not not dangling. Yeah, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, that's a that is a a, a very neat looking yes. uniform. But you're you're not wearing a hat of any kind. Well, inside, no. Okay. Mm -mm. Is the hobby hat gone by this time? Uh no, it wasn't. Mm -mm. No, mm. I still had that thing. Did you have to uh, have your hair cut, or did it you had have to be off your shoulders? Mm -hmm. Couldn't be long. Mm. Okay, well, uh, I just okay. noticed those things about the picture. Uh, so you've got this kind of information that comes through to you every day. Yeah, and we had to do all that changing, what have you. Uh, then I found out that the girl that was working in radio and post communications was going overseas. So I put in for her job mm -hmm. and got it. Uh, there at Stockton? Uh-huh. And I was working with 17 men, no women, 17 men, and they treated me like a sister. Uh, I love to play jokes, though. Uh, I had to check out the mobile control tower, which was uh, on a flatbed truck out on the field. Uh, we had batteries to run it, and it was for the officers, with the cadets, on landing and takeoff, and they give them instructions. So I had to check it every day, so I'd call in to the tower, and they made me repeat everything because in those days I had a southern accent. And then they would go up the control tower, up the stairs, they'd take my shoes off and toss them out under the planes, you know, for me to go get them. So, but uh, no, they, were, they were nice boys. With a sense of humor. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, now, what, uh, what responsibilities did you have? in this new position? Well, uh, like I said, checking the uh, 
control, uh, the mobile control tower, mm -hmm. going along with the guy, maybe going, checking out some uh, communication in a building or something, mm -hmm. and going with them. Okay. Then there was a direction finder, um, which I had to do, and I've always prayed every day that nothing would happen whenever I had to pull it. Uh, it was an early morning duty, I had to pull on this thing. If somebody plane was lost, and the pilot would call in and wanted to just where he was, <clears throat> it was my job to find out and let him know. Mm -hmm. I said, I always call, kept my fingers crossed that no one would ever call in because I said, I don't remember how to do this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, were you lucky and no one called? Yeah, I was lucky no one called. Really? How long did you do this? Not too long. I don't remember how long. Um, when I went to it, to it on six o'clock in the morning, the cadets were going to breakfast, marching to breakfast, and I get eyes right <laughs> when I went by. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't do it too long. Were there many women on the base? Uh, only about uh, fifty of us wax at the time. That, some civilian women were working there, and uh, not too many, but some. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the girl that was working in the enlisted men's war room, which was similar to this setup, we had uh, the maps up and uh, didn't have the teletalk machine, but did have the maps. Uh, and I was supposed to <laughs> be, uh, I got sent there. I even called the, the colonel in second command, said, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> no one ever came in there. It wasn't a, a, a order that they had to go. So nobody came except to see me. And uh, I said, I read books. I washed windows <laughs> just to have something to do. And I said, this is for the birds. I'm going to sign up for overseas. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for overseas and I learned teletype. And so that's it. While you were there? Yeah. Did they, you had to go to class while you were in Well, school? I went, I went to the, what we call the message center where they had teletype machines mm -hmm. and uh, where they did receive messages, uh, like Western Union was through there too. Mm -hmm. But uh, I learned teletype, which is nothing but typing, that's all. Mm -hmm. Well, now, we were talking before we started, uh, there wasn't a draft for women. No. So it was a volunteer to go into the service. And now you're telling me that you signed up to go overseas. Yeah. So that was a volunteer decision. That was decision. volunteer, too, until it finally came that they just sent you overseas. Mm -hmm. But very beginning, uh, there was a whole company uh, that volunteered to go overseas. So, you know, we weren't backward about mm -hmm. going. Did you know where you would be going? No, you didn't know. Okay. You didn't know till you got out of, on the ocean and found out. Okay. Well, tell me, when you found out that you were going to go overseas? Well, I found out in July. I uh, had to report July to of? 44. 44. Okay. I had to, had to go to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia for overseas training. And it was hot in August. Well, I had t some time at home before I had to go. So I did have some furlough. Mm -hmm. But I did report there in August. And um, we wore men's coveralls, long sleeves, uh, wore them for a whole week. <laughs> we didn't smell too nice <laughs> at the end. <laughs> but uh, we had uh, all kinds of classes, first aid, how to fall in the dirt, you know, in case of bombing. And uh, we did a lot of more marching. Uh, we had um, first aid, map reading. Uh, I don't remember what all. Were your instructors women? Yes. In the beginning, they were men. For your basic training? No, in the first, when the WAC first started. Oh, okay. Because they did not have any cadre for that. Mm -hmm. So it was men that started mm -hmm. with, but uh, no, there was women that were teaching us. But the time you were yeah. there, mm -hmm. you had women instructors. Right. Even for overseas? Yes. Had the instructors been overseas? No. Did, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. No. How long was this training? For a month, okay. and then uh, waiting around to ship out to go up to Camp Shanks, New York. Okay. I'm watching because we're getting 
<laughs> close to the end of the tape. I don't want to miss anything. Yeah. Uh, How did you get to New York? We had to, uh, well, by troop train, a friend and I, I, we still write, she and I and some others cleaned out one of these box cars to make a kitchen car out of it. Uh, we put the stove in there, wood, coal stove uh, in there, sitting in uh, sand and in a box-like mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but we cleaned out the box car to make it for, for the kitchen car. And there were German PWs sitting around outside there, and we were doing goose stepping. <laughs> this to be silly. And the boys were laughing at us. Mm -hmm. but, um, the, the German yeah, uh -huh. boys? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, have any opportunity to interact with them? You weren't supposed to. Uh, girls at uh, Stockton did some of them. They brought, uh, there were POWs at uh, Port of Stockton there, and they brought them over to our base for sick call. Mm -hmm. And so some of the girls would try to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Weren't supposed to, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to do something you're not supposed to. Right. Oh, and, on your way to uh -huh. catch It stopped a few minutes, and I could look up, you know, see part of the place. And uh, of course, you couldn't let, get off or do anything, you just had to sit there. So I went on up to New York, up to Camp Shanks and got off there. And uh, we were there, hmm, maybe about a couple, maybe two weeks, I'm not sure. Uh, but up there was more processing uh, insurance, our bonds, our uh, getting new, new uniforms. They take you uniforms and they were good, but they Toss them aside and issue you new stuff. Mm -hmm. And we packed a duffel bag, which was this tall, um, many, many times trying to get everything in it. Mm -hmm. So you could carry it. And they're heavy to carry once you get them packed. Uh, we did that. This goes way back. Barton Moomaw used to be the lead dancer for Ted Sean. Ted Who? T Barton Moomaw. Okay. Ted Sean was. Uh, a dancer back in my days, back in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, he had this troop of men, mm -hmm. and it was more athletic stuff than it was this fairy stuff. Um, they, uh, Barton and Ted both taught at Peabody College in 1940 one summer, mm -hmm. and I took that course. Well, Barton was drafted, and he was up there at Camp Shanks, and I saw him, and uh, they, uh, it was interesting. There was somebody else up there, uh, a guitarist that was a Spanish guitarist that was very famous. He was also there. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, this was a mixed group in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got ready to go overseas. We went down, took the ferry across over to Hudson's, uh, New York side, Manhattan side, and got on board the Queen Elizabeth. And we were on uh, the uh, main floor, I guess, main uh, deck, uh, in a cabin that was meant for two people. There were nine of us in it with bunks, you know, tears. We had a bathroom, <laughs> which was something. Uh, I have a friend, and I still write to her. Uh, she hung out the porthole, and she was yelling, Hey, where'd you get the balloons? And I looked out the porthole and I said, oh, Terry, those aren't balloons. Those are condoms. <laughs> and I, well, now, okay, this is going to be sort of a first, too. I've talked to a lot of, of servicemen who were, who talk about being on troop ships. I've talked to some who were on the Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. I haven't talked to any who said, I mean, they've talked about how many men were on yeah. there, but I haven't heard anything about women being on those troop oh, we ships. Oh, were there. <laughs> How many women were on this troop ship? Uh, oh, maybe a thousand. I'm not sure. Really? I know it was a thousand coming home. Mm -hmm. Something like but that. But now there were also yeah. service men on this ship. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. We had our own place. Um, I had to pull guard duty, uh, guard duty on our deck one midnight. <laughs> I was so sick. Second day out, I'm seasick. I couldn't stand up. I couldn't <laughs> sit up. And... It was miserable, but I had to pull guard duty. So here I am lying on the floor there, and Officer Day comes by, and he just laughs at me, you know, and he <laughs> thought it was funny. <laughs> but I finished, and I just crawled back down to my deck, my cabin. Mm -hmm. but, uh, 
Now, were you kept separate yes. from men on the ship? I mean, but were you able to to spend any time with them? Up on deck you could, but not too often. Uh, it was still kind of separated. Uh, the uh, We had to eat five decks below. <laughs> it was next to the garbage. The officers all had the dining room with the tables with tablecloths and lamps on them, you know. Mm -hmm. We had these bare tables <laughs> and tin pans to eat out of. And going down, the boy said, Oh, you look green. You're not going to make it. <laughs> um, now, you knew that you weren't going into combat, but for a lot of these young men, they knew they were going into combat. Could you tell anything in their attitude? No. Mm -mm. No. Um, I, uh, I met people that came from the front. London was a great place to be. Uh, I could have been killed there just as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. V two hit five blocks away. If it hit closer, we could have had it. I interviewed a lady who lived in London oh, during yeah. that time, and I mean, she was just very casual about it but I mean it was just a nightly thing yeah the bombing was just yeah. nightly and you, she car carried a gas mask to school mm -hmm. uh, she said she kept her makeup in hers but <laughs> <laughs> but you know in the case but uh, I mean it was just a daily oh, occurrence yeah. in their mm -hmm. lives how many people do you think were on this troop ship just roughly I think all, all I can remember coming home that they had about 15,000 on there uh, were you in convoy? No, because these two ships, Elizabeth and the Mary, were too fast, mm -hmm. and they didn't ever have an escort. Okay. How long did it take you to get across? Six days. Six days. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> when we saw Scotland, oh, was it great. Uh, finally, we were in still waters where we, you know. Were you sick the whole time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I bet you don't take many cruises today. I do never you? have since. <laughs> no way. <laughs> okay. I, you know, on the ship, uh, the boys we only ate twice a day because there's so many on board, and we didn't eat breakfast at ten thirty in the morning. So I'm sitting in the hall in the hallway, and the boys would go by, and somebody would give me a piece of toast, and somebody else gave me a hard boiled egg, and sometimes I'd pass stuff in to my friends, you know. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, and then when we found out we were going to England, I said, oh, I want to go to an air base. I want to have a dog and a bicycle and paint naked women on the nose of the planes. Well, I didn't get to do that. <laughs> what did you do? I got to London. <laughs> well, tell me about that. That must have been a, a fabulous experience. That was one of the reasons you joined was to yeah, go overseas. Right. So now you're overseas. Uh, London, we got there about uh, the 30th of September. They had just stopped the V1s uh, bombs coming. There were the ones, the little robot bombs that came over and the motor had shut off and it shut off, you know, it's going to drop. Well, we just missed those, so we had the V2s, but they had just started. And Well, tell me about the V2s. The V2 is tall as a seven-story wind a building. and um, The bomb? Yeah. It was a, you know these rockets that we have to shoot the spacecraft in that mm -hmm. orbit? Well, that's where they came from. It's that type of that thing. Of course, these are bigger now, but they were tall. Um, they didn't ha have a motor that cut off. It, they just came and just dropped. Um, one hit five blocks away from where we lived on uh, Duke Street, which this is in the middle of London. And uh, we uh, worked uh, t uh, about 10 blocks away from where we lived. But this was five blocks from where we lived. And it rocked the bed and cracked the wall, and it blew a taxi right through the side of Selfridge's department store there on Duke Street, and uh, uh, took out the pub that was there. Uh, later on, you could see half of the building that was there, and a bathtub up there in the bath in the bathroom. Uh, then one hit uh, in Hyde Park, which. Uh, speaker's corner which on Sunday is very busy in the afternoon but it hit in the morning and my shift had just gotten off at 8 30 and the other had gone on it hit about 9 30 and I had friends that were on that shift uh, two of them got purple hearts because of it. 
But he hid across in Hyde Park. It just twisted the doorknobs in the building. It shattered all the windows. And that was in February. And we didn't have heat anyway, so we were working in overcoats. But they really uh, made a mess. What was your assignment? Teletype. We did all kinds of messages, and a lot of it in code. I, uh, if I wanted to know what it said, I went in the radio room and read it. <laughs> but uh, where what? Uh, well, what was the course of these messages? Where were they headed? Where were they well, coming they could, from? What did it involve? They were. Uh, they went to France. They, we had a station. Uh, I was Air, Army Airways Communication System, and we had stations all over the place. Um, they had one in Russia, they had one in France, they had one in Sweden, they had of course a lot of them in England and, and Scotland and Wales. And uh, I guess we had some in Spain. Um, so messages would go there. We also had lines to, to the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, any time that line went out we always said the fish are nibbling on it, you know. That <laughs> well, um, but uh, most of it was concerning aircraft uh, time of arrival or time of this or that and of course uh, I don't know what all the coded messages said. But, uh, it sounds like you would have been very busy. Uh, midnight shift was not too bad. You have to <laughs> do things to stay awake, you know. One night Brent and I sat across from each other and threw ink at each other. <laughs> and we had these big barrels that paper rolls had come in and they'd put us in the barrel and roll us around. I mean, you know, had to stay awake. Mm -hmm. Were there many women working there? Oh, we all went, well, mostly women. It was a co-ed group, actually. Uh, there were men. Uh, I don't remember how many of us were on the shift, uh, but uh, it was both. What kind of reception did you get in London as a as a uh, service woman well in uniform huh <laughs> prostitutes tried to take your man away from you <laughs> he'd go down the street at night and blackout you know and here would come one up to feel his shoulder see if he's an officer and if not bars or whatever on the field to see what rank he had you know and they'd try to get your date away from you were you allowed to date? Oh something? yes, oh yes. That wasn't uh -uh. off You couldn't date an officer though, that was a no-no. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, What restrictions did you have? Uh, couldn't had, date officers? We, no, uh, we could stay out all night. <laughs> we had that kind of pass mm -hmm. and that's what we did. V.E. and I, my roommate and I were celebrating with two sailors and we stayed out all night and uh, the Navy had to take us to work the next day because it was a holiday and uh, transportation doesn't run on a holiday over there then. And uh, so they they worked for the motor pool, so they just called up the motor pool, Navy motor pool, and had them take us to work. <laughs> but, so, let's see, now you said you went over in July of 44. So I went over in September of 44. September uh -huh. of 44. Yeah. So D-Day has already occurred. Oh yes, I was on KP on D-Day in Stockton. <laughs> I said, oh, the war's going to be over. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but you were in uh, England when the war ended. Oh yes. Good celebrations. Oh yeah, big celebrations all over the place. We, uh, my friend and I went to the dentist the day before, <laughs> and I always have trouble. Was it the seventh or the eighth? Uh, we went to the dentist. Said, we know something you don't know. <laughs> and he said, "I know it. <laughs> it, it." It got spread around. We were we got it noticed two days before it was officially announced. Oh, really? Yeah. And so, so we knew. Yeah, so we knew, but he had already heard it too. So <laughs> on the secret. Hmm. But, uh, How long? Uh, after the war ended in Europe, how long were you there? I was there until November of 45. Okay. What did you do during that time? Same old work. It went on just the same. Mm -hmm. Except when we got orders to go home. I had enough points to go home. 
could have gone on to Germany. Some of our girls already had gone to Germany. I said, oh, I want to go home. I wish I had gone. <laughs> Did you travel <coughs> during we that time? We went to Scotland on furlough uh, in April of 44, a friend and I, and met up with two GIs that had come from the front on furlough. And uh, we went around with them. Did they talk about the war? No, we didn't talk about it. So many uh, veterans have told me that when they came home, they didn't talk about it yeah. for years and years. And so these guys have just come off the front, yeah. but they weren't talking at that no, we didn't, And then we didn't think to ask them anything either, you know. It was just boy met girl. So. Mm -hmm. And London, at times, they were sending them back from the front like a thousand a day. And you couldn't walk down the street without boys grabbing hold of you each time, you know. Just want to talk to an American girl. That's a pretty good position to be in, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. <laughs> now, you said you met your husband as a pen pal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, how does he fit in to this well, story? Well, he and his brother came from Germany here in 1937. And of course, he, he got drafted. He was going to be a citizen. And... Uh, he got stationed in Bermuda, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when I wrote to him. That was in last of '41, mm -hmm. and I didn't meet him till about '47. Oh, okay. And uh, we wrote all that time. But so you wrote to him while you were in England. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a sweet story. <laughs> so was did he was he in Bermuda throughout the? Pretty much the war. Yeah. The whole war. Uh -huh, yeah. He had his brother joined the Air Force, or was, well, I'm sure he joined the Air Force. Uh, but he went to Europe and he w did work as a translator after the war over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me more of your experiences in England. Oh, England, let's see. Oh, I had a bicycle. Uh, I used to ride it over to the Whack Red Cross to get spam sandwiches. Oh, that was a treat, really. Because English go for this cucumber sandwich or this watercress sandwich, and that's nothing. And when we heard that the Whack Red Cross had spam sandwiches, we made sure we paid them a visit. Mm -hmm. I used to ride my bicycle over there, brought it in the blackout. Well, one of these questions that I will ask you that may or may not apply, you're talking about blackouts yeah. and bombings. Um, did you feel pressure? Or stress? Did I what? Feel pressure or no. stress? No, no, no. Mm -mm. I even thought I was going to come home because I bought some uh, dishes and put them under the bed. <laughs> and they came home with me. Oh, really? I, I didn't think anything. You know, you're there. And there's nothing you can do about it. And so what happens, happens, you know. But you were planning on taking those dishes yeah, back. Yeah, I was going to go home with them. Yeah. That's, that is really neat. Um, what was the food like while you were in London? Other than, uh, you're telling me about the watercress sandwiches and the spam sandwiches. Food in England was terrible. Now, it's improved a lot. My husband and I used to go back to Europe. Mm -hmm. And it, it has improved. But at that time, they couldn't make coffee. I learned to drink tea. That's one thing I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, of course, they were rations, so you couldn't eat in a restaurant and have a real good meal. You mean, you know, it was a certain price, a certain thing you got, and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, as far as the Army food was good, uh, concerned, uh-uh. It was powdered eggs for breakfast, uh, like rubber, and uh, things that, uh, you know, shipping at that time was hard, too, for, you know, to ship stuff over. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't too much good stuff. I I had <clears throat> I had a boyfriend, uh, childhood boyfriend, who ended up with a 12th troop carrier squadron in in uh, Europe. Went to North Africa, then Sicily. Uh, I got a book on the uh, 12th troop carrier memoirs. He's in it. Uh, I found out they ate much better over there than they did than we did in England. They had steaks and everything, and I said, "Oh my gosh!" I've talked to servicemen who 
were very unhappy with their food in England while they were waiting oh. to, to go across the channel. Yeah. They were Most very people unhappy. hate Brussels sprouts. Now, I like Brussels sprouts. So I said, well, that didn't bother me in England, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, no, and it, they didn't know how to cook in those days. That's what we thought. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, we were talking about you writing to your future husband in Bermuda yeah. all during the war. Uh, you wrote letters home? Oh, yes, uh-huh, yeah. But they didn't save them. You know, who knew in those days that they would be important, you know? Mm -hmm. But some people just saved everything, whatever. <laughs> Was your mail censored? Oh, yes, uh-huh. I, uh, we lived on Harley Street, which is the doctor's street in London, still is. Uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning lived on Wimple Street, the next street over. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote my father, I said, I go by Elizabeth Barrett's house every day, you know. And Censor caught it, I said, I didn't think they would be smart enough. <laughs> oh, so they cut it out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Because <laughs> oh that would give, that's a dead giveaway where you are. Mm -hmm. yes. We're supposed to do that. My goodness. Well, they ask about humorous and unusual events, and it sounds like that, that you did have, it, it wasn't all work. You did no, experience. No, no, uh-uh. We had fun. Humor yeah, and fun. Yeah. Did entertainment come into your area? Well, now see London. Well, I mean, some of the sh uh, shows and things. Well, we lived in a townhouse. Okay. So we didn't have anything you know, like boys would at a, in a camp. Uh-huh. But there were movies we'd go to that were American movies, mm -hmm. only for us. Mm -hmm. uh, we had free rides on the underground, on the bus, whatever. Mm -hmm. And a friend and I used to just go take a trip on the bus to the end of the line to see where it went, you know, mm -hmm. and things. I bought so many books over there, I sent them home, and my father had to buy another bookcase. <laughs> my goodness. Well, now, one of the uh, questions that I would ask you is, did you make close friendships while you were in the service? And I, I've already gathered from what you're saying that you did. Mm-hmm. And you maintained contact with those people? Yes. This is her, my friend. Uh-huh. Her, let's see, her daughter and, and, and this, her daughter. That's a, this one's grandchild. So you met her in the service? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was she stationed with you? Yeah, we were stationed together in London. And what's her name? Flo. Florence. Yeah. Florence. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. And, and now, you have also told me that you're very much involved in veterans' organizations. Oh, yes. Tell me about your work with... Well, um, my personal stuff... Uh, I've sent 140 books to UT, to their Center for Study of War and Society, mm -hmm. which most of them are about women, are by women, or about women mm -hmm. in the military in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, I also, of course, uh, feed my own stuff over to UNC. Mm -hmm. Yes, you said you had a collection yeah. there of your own materials. Yeah. I'm sitting here looking at uh, women in the military today, Barbie doll. <laughs> 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 they're, they're in... Uh, I guess uniforms that represent yeah every branch. This is a paratrooper on the end over here. Okay. Uh huh. And this is boot camp on this end. And uh, there's a girl from Desert Storm. And of course, Air Force and the Navy. Now, is that display just here at home, or do you? That was for Tennessee Military Collectors Association show. Okay. So you're very actively involved in promoting. Awareness of, of women's roles mm. in my friend and I make up displays for the shows Behind you is our plaque that we won this last time for our exhibit so Where are these shows? Oh, uh, they were at the armory until 9-11 and then now we were out at the Marriott in Franklin mm -hmm. and You can <laughs> getting too old. Um, where did I put it? Oh, here. Oh, I taught to four classes at Glencliff High School. Oh, my. Are the, uh, are the students today surprised when you tell them where the beginnings, what the beginnings were like for women's involvement in the military? Well, I, most of these, uh, a lot of them are 
English as second language. And so they don't know the history of any of this stuff, so it's just kind of something brand new to them. Mm -hmm. uh, but like at UNC, now I was told that they had an exhibit, World War II exhibit, and he used some of my stuff. Mm -hmm. And most of the kids didn't know women had been involved in World War II. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, when did your service end? November 13, 1945. Okay. This is from the last show, one we got the plaque for. I'm going to look at these in just a moment. I want to ask you before we get to the end of the tape. Okay. The impact of your time in the service on your life and the impact just for women of your generation. It really opened a lot of doors. And it did lives. open doors. Uh, I don't think we realized at the time what we were doing. Uh, we were pioneers. Uh, what the girls are doing today, would they wouldn't be doing it if we hadn't come along in World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there were some in World War One, the Yeomanettes, you know, from the Navy. But they didn't have that kind of uh, training that we had. They wore uniforms, and they were in the Navy, but they didn't have that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't think at the time we realized how important it was. I think as we gotten older that we realized that... Um, hey, we were a very important part of the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're still not recognized as such. You know, the World War II uh, Memorial, uh, if it hadn't been for Harriet being on the commission, we wouldn't be listed. Mm -hmm. But the two generals, the retired generals said, uh, we were too insignificant to count. I said, I'd love to kick them. How many women, do you have any, um, because of your work after the war, uh, do you have any idea how many women served in World War II? I think there were 350,000. That's not insignificant. No, it isn't. Do you think, um, did the wax, did they begin as just being a temporary thing during the war, or did they know it was supposed to be temporary. Was it was it? supposed to be, once the wars were over, well, you were going to serve for the duration plus six months. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, it was supposed to end, but they found out that they they really needed women, you know, and they it was thought that they stay in. Now, did you consider no. re-enlisting? Well, see, that came too long afterwards. So... You didn't have an option to re-enlist no. mm -mm. at that point in no. time? Would you have, do you think? I don't think so. I think I'd had enough. <laughs> Got your world travel in. <laughs> well, the impact on you personally? I don't know. I think uh, it broadened my horizon. I made uh, friends from different parts of the country, uh, from... Uh, learn how to take orders, you know, and kind of be independent. And I think it's a good experience. Did you work after the war? Oh, yeah. Now, that was something that women had uh, primarily been in the home. Oh, yeah. There, I mean, there were some that worked, but uh, it was unusual, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Do you think you decided to work because of your No, I was go I was working before, mm -hmm. so... It wasn't that. I was, you know, a single. I wasn't married. Uh, had no fam. Well, I had family, my parents, but uh, uh, it wasn't a case of sitting at home. Mm -hmm. Did you use the GI Bill? Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. I uh, decided to go back to school. I'd worked, and I wanted to go back and take some art courses, which I did. I went to Peabody, and then I transferred to New York City to catch my husband. <laughs> really. <laughs> Uh, you impressed me as a lady who knew what she wanted, and you just went after it. Well. <laughs> so you did um, you did benefit from the GI Bill. Yeah, right. That was a fantastic program. It was. It really was. A lot of people would never have been able to have gone to college or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this interview about your experience? All I can say is it was a fantastic time. Uh, it was we were a part of history, and I hope people realize it. 
I've just got to find more women that are willing to, to speak well, out I'm about it. I'm see what I can do about it. <laughs> Thank you for doing this interview today. <laughs> well, I'm you're gonna, welcome. I'm going to tell story. We went to Fort Bragg to be discharged, and there were about a hundred Negro whites on the train, plus the white gals. When we got to Fort Bragg, it was put on the siding, and we had to wait to be switched in. Well, there was a cafe nearby. We got off the train, went and got coffee, and we said, well, the girls, the, the black girls can't do that, so let's take coffee back to them, and that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, there were uh, African Americans serving, but they served in segregated yes. groups at that time. Did you, had you seen any of them other than there at Fort Bragg? No. Mm -mm. That's...